Hello there. So I'm going to talk to you about serology today. I do have two helpers here. I have Lulu. Lulu, say hi. Hi, I'm Lulu. Lulu's going to help me. And I have Charlie. Here's Charlie. Say hi. Hi, I'm Charlie. They're both a little smelly, so I'm going to talk as fast as I can so that I don't have to smell these smelly dogs any longer than necessary. So you already know what serology is. Serology is the study of bodily fluids. And those bodily and fluids include bodily fluids include things like blood, but also semen, saliva, and urine. Um, those are kind of the main ones. There are some others like sweat, but really if we're collecting sweat, we're collecting it so that we can have epithelial cells. And that's, you know, pretty much it. And that's just going to go straight to DNA. So um, things like urine, saliva, semen, blood have other stuff in them that are going to be helpful to us. Um, because it's the most interesting, but also because it's the most complicated, we're going to start with blood. So for starters, blood is considered a tissue. It's just like muscle or fat or connective tissue or any other kind of tissue. Um, it's kind of weird because sometimes, well, most of the time, I think we tend to think of body tissues as being solids um, and we don't really think of them as being liquids. Um, but even though blood is a liquid, it is still considered to be a tissue. Um, keep in mind, one of the things that's kind of hard for students to remember is that blood is not just blood cells. So we're not just talking about those blood cells. We're actually talking about a whole solution of various different things. So the main sort of substance of the solution is this stuff called plasma. And plasma is made up of about 90% water. And then the other 10% is a mixture of things like proteins, um, urea, by the way, urea is not urine. Urea is just, it's a, it's a byproduct of breaking down nitrogenous waste. Um, urea is not urine. So if you look at your shampoo bottle right now, um, seriously, go look at your shampoo bottle right now. There's a good chance that one of the ingredients on there is urea and it's, it might say plant urea or it might name, you know, a specific plant, but just that does not mean that plants were peeing inside your shampoo bottle. That's not what happened there. Um, urea is just, it's a chemical. It's the name of a chemical. So if you look at that and you're like, ew, there's urine in my blood. Well, no, that's not what the case is. Um, sorry, I'm moving the camera around. I got to move the computer. I'm not quite comfy here. There are too many dogs situated. Um, so that plasma is also going to have hormones, carbohydrates, fats, different salts, just whatever you need to have. There's going to be dissolved oxygen in there. There's going to be dissolved carbon dioxide in there. Um, hopefully most of that's going to be bound up on your red blood cells, but we'll get there later. So as you look at this picture, then you can see right here where it says P plasma um, and that yellowish substance, uh, which is kind of funny because I just spent all this time telling you it's not urine and it looks like urine, doesn't it? Um, that yellowish substance is your plasma. Now there is plasma here too. Um, it's just that there are blood cells dissolved in it. So this is your sort of pure plasma, if you will, up here. Um, so this is the plasma, that's the solution that everything else is gonna be dissolved in or not dissolved in, suspended in, floating around in. So you've also got these things called red blood cells. You already know about red blood cells, you know they exist, but the fancy science word for them is erythrocyte, erythrocytes. Site just means cells. So erythrocytes, those are the red blood cells. Their job is to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide throughout your body. So remember that red blood cells have hemoglobin and hemoglobin is a protein that attaches, that binds to oxygen. And that's gonna help get that oxygen around your body. So actually hemoglobin makes your red blood cells 60 times more efficient um, than if you did not have hemoglobin. Yay, hemoglobin. Red blood cells are made in your bone marrow. So interestingly, Red blood cells don't make new red blood cells. Red blood cells come from your bone marrow. So if you need new red blood cells, you need to go to the bone marrow for them. You can't have red blood cells going through mitosis. That's because red blood cells, as they mature, lose their nuclei. And since they lose their nuclei, they can't go under undergo mitosis. Like there's just like not that it just wouldn't happen. Um, since they don't have nuclei, they don't have DNA. Red blood cells don't have DNA. What? Blood cells don't have DNA. But Ganant, that's crazy talk because I know that if somebody wants DNA, they're gonna draw blood and that's where they're gonna get the DNA from. 
aha, you just need to wait a minute and I will address that issue. Some random cool information. Um, there are about 5 million red blood cells in one milliliter of blood. So if you think about just a glass dropper, like, you know, the kind that has the, the black rubber um, squeezy thing at the top and then it's just a glass dropper, that's about a milliliter usually. So in one of those, you're gonna have five million red blood cells. That's insane. Each red blood cell is about six to eight micrometers in diameter. So again, for reference, think about that, the field of view on our microscopes at 40X magnification, well, 400X magnification on the 40X objective is about 375 micrometers. So if you figure 375 micrometers, six to eight micrometers, those are pretty tiny. Red blood cells only live for about four months. So every four months, you've got a whole new set of red blood cells from what you had before. When we look at this diagram, the main part of your red blood cells is gonna be down here, but there are still red blood cells up here suspended out in this solution. Um, so this, basically what happened, I, I guess I didn't explain this, what happened is they took this tube of blood and they put it into a machine called a centrifuge and they spun it around and around and around and around, and around, and around super, super fast, like thousands of revolutions per minute. Um, and so they spun it around and when they spin it around like that, everything that's dense goes down to the bottom and everything that's less dense stays up at the top. And so the, the red blood cells went down to the bottom and separated out to the bottom. So most of them are here, but some of them are up in here. I got a little animation issue. I don't know, I've tried to fix it, can't fix it, so deal with it. Um, you also have white blood cells. And white blood cells, their fancy science name is leukocytes. So again, you've got site there to tell you that this is a cell. Leukocytes are white blood cells. And their job is that they're in charge of immune responses. So anytime you're getting sick, you've got something, some invader coming into your body, leukocytes are the ones that are gonna help you out. Leukocytes are not as numerous as red blood cells, nowhere near as many. Um, generally, you're gonna have 10 to 15,000 per milliliter. So whereas with red blood cells, we were talking about 5 million of them, now we're just talking about 10 to 15,000 of these white blood cells. Now, white blood cells do have nuclei. And since they do have nuclei, they have DNA. So in fact, it's your white blood cells that are gonna rat you out when it comes to sharing your DNA. If you can find a way to leave behind only red blood cells at a crime scene, you're solid. The problem is you leave behind any white blood cells, DNA just got left behind. There are three major types of white blood cells. The first are macrophages. Macro means big, phage means eat. So macrophages are big eaters. They're the ones that if you've got invaders coming into your body like bacteria or viruses, they're gonna come in and hop, 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 hop. They're gonna gobble them up. They're just gonna go whoop, eat them. Um, so macrophages are kind of awesome because they come in and they're like, hey, you done. Uh, but they can't eat everything up. They can't gobble everything up. So there are these other things called neutrophils. Neutrophils are the first responders. They're the ones that like, let's say you've got a cut. They're gonna be the first ones who get there to that cut and they're gonna start yelling and screaming. Okay, not really yelling and screaming, but they're gonna start giving orders, sending out signals, saying we need some of these over here, we need some of these over here, bring us some platelets, bring us some of these, bring us some of these, and they're gonna get everything that you need over there to help heal whatever that wound is or you know, deal with whatever that problem is. And then you've got lymphocytes. Lymphocytes actually produce antibodies and they produce memory cells, okay? So this is really, really, really cool. So if it's somebody, some invader comes into your body, let's say a cold virus, okay? A cold virus comes into your body, your lymphocytes are gonna start producing antibodies. So they're gonna, start, they're gonna try to recognize that cold virus and they might say, eh, it seems kind of like, wait, stop, before I continue on with this, let me just put a disclaimer on this. I'm gonna super duper oversimplify this, like really oversimplify it and I'm gonna do a lot of personification and I'm gonna anthropomorphize your blood cells. And I mean, just it is what it is, okay? But here's, here's how it works and it's cool. So the lymphocytes are gonna produce antibodies, which are like bullets. They're just little proteins. They're little protein molecules. And they're gonna start shooting out these little protein molecules. And they're gonna be like, here, this worked on somebody who was like you, pew, 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 pew. And the antibody's not gonna work. 
And then they're going to be like, wait, let me try this. This worked on somebody who was like you. Pew, 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 pew. And it's going to shoot the antibodies out. It's not going to work. So at some point, your body's going to be like, well, let's try some new things. And it's going to try out some new proteins. And so it's going to go pew, 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 pew. And something's going to work. And when that thing works, then the lymphocytes are going to, going to produce these things that are called memory cells. And the memory cells are going to remember that virus and connect that virus with the antibody that worked in order to get rid of that that virus and so the next time that virus comes into your body your body's gonna go aha i know you because the memory cells are gonna totally rat them out okay they're gonna be like i know you and then all of a sudden pew 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 knock out all of those not knock out that virus done and done you never even knew it happened at this point so the first time you felt all crappy because there's the immune immune response and, your body got angry and you got snotty and coffee and whatever. But this time, you're not even going to know it because your body's going to take care of it. So it's in and out. So once you've had that thing come in, your body's like, oh, got this. So now you're asking yourself, wait a minute. Gamant is crazy because I get a cold every year. So if my body figures out how to fight off a cold, why do I keep getting a cold? Well, think about it. Yes, mutations, that's the answer. So when we talk about different strains of the cold, what that means is that each year it evolves, the cold virus evolves and there are different mutations. And so that virus might go into someone and the DNA or the RNA, whatever kind of virus it is, I mean, if we're talking about a cold virus, whatever, um, whatever kind of nucleic acids it's got in there, are gonna mutate a little bit. And if they mutate a little bit, then when it comes in, my body doesn't recognize what that virus is anymore. My body's like, oh, you're a whole new thing. And so let me try this out. So let me tell you the worst thing that happened, okay, not the worst, but a bad thing that happened is when I moved back here. So I had been in Africa for four years. I moved back here my first year back here. I was sick the whole time because even though I'd had cold and flu and whatever a million times before I went overseas. While I was overseas, you people were back here mutating all the viruses. And so those viruses came into my body and every single one of them came into my body and I was sick. And so that first year was just awful because I had to build up immunity to everything again. And so my body was getting angry over and over and over again. So uh, these are the white blood cells. Okay, so right here in this little layer right here, these are your white blood cells. So um, by comparison, again, remember 500 million red blood cells, 10 to 15,000 white blood cells. Okay, so nowhere near as many white blood cells as you've got red blood cells. All right, so identifying blood. There are tests that are called presumptive tests. And presumptive tests are done in the field. So that means they're done at your crime scene. They're done wherever it is that you are out. They're highly sensitive. They're super duper sensitive. And that's because it is better for you to be like, oh yeah, this is blood and collect it and take it back to the lab. And then maybe you get to the lab and you're like, oh yeah, that wasn't really blood. It's better to do that than it is to leave evidence behind at a crime scene. So wouldn't it suck if you were like, oh, that's not blood. And then you found out later, oh, crud, that really was blood. We didn't collect it. We didn't have it. Now we don't have that thing. So it's better for a presumptive test to be overly sensitive than underly sensitive. Is underly a word? Anyway, um, for that reason, you end up with a higher chance of a false positive. So a false positive means you get a positive test, meaning a test result that says, yes, this is blood. So you get this false positive or you get this positive test, but it's a false positive. So whoopsie, wasn't really blood, but you find that out later and you find that out when you've got that substance back at the lab. So again, better to have too much evidence that then you're like, oh my bad, I collected something I shouldn't have collected than to leave evidence behind. The thing about presumptive tests is that they don't differentiate between species. So you could have uh, human blood at the crime scene, you could have cow blood at the crime scene, could be cat, could be dog, could be, you know, any number of things. A presumptive test isn't going to tell you if that's human blood or if that's some other kind of blood. 
Some examples of uh, some presumptive tests are the Castle-Meyer test. Um, Castle-Meyer is if you, um, uh, of course, I'm going to refer back to the crime TV shows. If you see them with a swab and they, they swab a sample and then they take a dropper and they drop and then it turns bright pink and they go, oh, this is blood. That's the Castle-Meyer test. Luminol and Blue Star, those are both the ones where they spray stuff on it and then you'll get a glow. Um, so you get this glowing reaction. So really what happens with a presumptive test is that generally you've got a chemical and that chemical is going to react with the hemoglobin in the blood. Remember the hemoglobin is on the red blood cells. It's going to react with the hemoglobin in the blood and you're going to either going to get a color change. So that bright pink color of the Castle-Meyer test, or you're going to get a fluorescence. So you're going to get that glow of the luminol and the blue star. You could also use an alternate light source like a UV light to enhance the results, but you don't need it. It's not necessary. So Luminol and Blue Star, they're going to glow whether you've got an alternate light source or not. Um, it's nice. It helps out, but it's definitely not a necessity. All right, confirmatory tests now are exactly what they sound like. They're going to help you confirm that this thing that you took back to the lab is blood. So a confirmatory test then is going to be done in the lab. Confirmatory tests are more selective. They're going to have a higher threshold, a higher standard for saying, yes, this is blood, because this is the be all end all. Yes, absolutely. I know this is blood kind of thing. Um, again, once we're back in the lab, it's better to be more critical. It's better to be sort of more judgy about this. Now, with confirmatory tests, some of them can differentiate between species. Some of them can't. Um, most specifically, if you want to differentiate between species, you better know what different species of blood cells look like. So microscopic analysis of cells, you pop those bad boys under the microscope, start looking at them, you should be able to tell. If you're an experienced microscopist and an experienced serologist, you should be able to tell the difference between a dog red blood cell and a human red blood cell and a cow's red blood cell. Um, there's another test called the Takayama test. Say Takayama, it's fun. Go ahead, Takayama. Uh, the Takayama test. Takayama test is a confirmatory test that involves heating the blood. So you take the blood, you heat it up, and then you add a set of chemicals. They're kind of like pretty nasty, strong acids. But you add the set of chemicals, and then you look at them, and you'll see if these salmon-colored microscopic crystals form. So the thing is, this is done under the microscope, too. So you're looking for this chemical reaction that happens that then gives you these crystals under the microscope. Um, the nice thing about the Takayama test is that it'll work even with really, really old blood. So even if you have tons of old blood, or tons of, if you've, even if you have very old blood, the Takayama test can help confirm for you, yes, this is blood, not, you know, really old, dried up, some other substance that you thought was blood but isn't. Most of the time, these days, presumptive tests are going to be enough for you to say, yeah, this substance is blood. So the presumptive tests are accurate enough um, and, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they work well enough for you to say, yep, I'm pretty sure this is blood. So um, what you would do then is rather than spend the time and the money on confirmatory tests, so going through the Takayama test, if you need to look at this further, you're going to send it straight to DNA and you're going to be like, hey, see if you can get some DNA out of this for me. Now, you might stop and do, depending on what, what state your blood is in, you might do some blood typing. And that's a thing we'll talk about next time. Um, so you might want to do some blood typing in there, too. But, you know, for the most part, blood's going to DNA. Um, just so that you know. So this is that Castle-Meyer test that I was talking to you about. So this is the presumptive test. And then this is the Takayama test. So these are those crystals that form with the Takayama test. So this is positive. Obviously, this substance was blood, um, and it formed these salmon-colored crystals, and this is a microscopic view here. All right, so I believe that's it. Uh, I have no more to tell you about blood, uh, at least for now. I'll tell you more later. Okay, bye.